Hello and welcome. Welcome to, I think it's our class number five of the 12 week healthy relationship program. So I'm on just a minute or so early so that everybody can log in and join as soon as they get the, uh, thank you, welcome, as soon as they get the message. And so tonight, before we begin, I just want you to know that um, had a lot of work this week and so my normal um, notes, hello, hello. My normal notes, I didn't do as much work on as I normally do. And so, so much of this is going to come from me, um, you know, from my experience. And so, the flow of tonight, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is I'm not exactly sure where we're going to end. So, I want to work with the triangle. Thank you all for joining. Um, I want to work with the triangle, and I'm going to give you some real life, right, ways to apply this to your work relationships, your love relationships. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that we, we use the triangle. And so I've talked in the past about complaining, gossiping, withholding, lying. And we're, gonna, we're going to really get into the details of this so that you can see how we all do it plus what other people do. And the key is, is that we don't judge, right? We don't judge others. We don't judge self. We don't blame others. We don't blame self. We are all, every single one of us, doing absolutely the best we can in this moment with the knowledge and the tools and the energy that we have today. And so absolutely, this work that I do when I point this out is not because of judgment, right? Observing. When you can observe outside of the triangle, hello, hello. When you can observe outside of the triangle without judgment or blame, then you are able to learn more about the other person in order to, uh, to affect, right, beneficial, loving, caring, gentle change. You always have a choice of being right or being kind, choose kind. And you learn more about yourself so that you understand the triangle and can live outside of it as often as you can. I want you to know the triangle is a natural although maladaptive behavior script. And we all get in it, and the faster you can recognize that, the faster you can get out. And the healthy changes are outside of the triangle. So let's kind of get started. We'll kind of go through a little bit of the basics. So on your triangle, there is a victim, a perpetrator, and a rescuer. And we play all three roles. We do it differently with different people at different circumstances, depending on our old scripts and programs, which we learned um, from day one. So a rescuer is trying to get their needs met by rescuing another. They generally have an arrogance of all knowing. So they would be the, the preachers, right, that tell you, Oh, you should do this. Have you thought of that? You need to go to this doctor. You need to try this. You need to read this book, right? You need to go to this counselor. You, you need to look at Heather's video. <laughs> that might be a rescuer. Um, they are super responsible. And a lot of times for stuff that isn't even theirs, they take on the troubles of everyone in order to avoid their own pain and avoid doing their own inner work, right? Because that's painful. We all know how painful doing our inner work can be. Again, they are the preacher. You'll hear a lot of, you need to, you should. Those are red flags. If, if you hear yourself saying it, check and make sure you're not being a rescuer in the triangle. If someone else tells you this, you may feel like a victim and you'll, you, most of us don't want to be the victim and it feels very uncomfortable. Those will be your red flags. So again, observing others, not judging. Are they coming from this place of a rescuer, making you a victim? 
They are people pleasers, have to be. So somewhere in the beginning, they felt like if they weren't pleasing people, they wouldn't be loved, they wouldn't be cared for. They will absolutely be a doormat in order to please others. They are perfectionists. Many times they get stuck and can't move forward because it can't be perfect. And it needs to be perfect, why? So that they're people pleasers. Um, they can't say no, that's a, that's a big one. Those of you who knew me from my previous life, right, just a few years ago, I volunteered for everything, everything. And then I would complain later because I had no time for myself and I didn't really want to do it, but I couldn't say no because it was expected and I was a people pleaser. A victim comes at this, right, from a place of I can't do it. I'm not capable, um, there's something wrong with me, I'm broken. It's all my fault. They will often say that. They'll take the blame for everything. These will be the people that will say, oh, I'm sorry, when they bump into a wall. There's nobody there, but immediately they say sorry. Everywhere they go, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, my bad, right? Not even theirs, but they're apologizing for it. That's a, that's a red flag of victim. So if you are, as so many of you are that I know, chronic apologizers, you apologize for breathing, right? Be more gentle on yourself. That's your red flag that you are in a victim, right, a victim role. Most of the time, victims don't believe there's any other choice, right? It's that one, the horrible one. There's nothing else we can do. Nothing anybody can do, right? That's just the way it is. We have to, we have to live this way because there's no other choice. And you'll hear that even though there are obviously two or more choices, but because the one doesn't fit what they want, right, an attachment to the outcome, we'll talk about that, then there are no choices. And that often they're stuck in despair, the woe is me, right? So perpetrators are your bullies and hurt people hurt other people, they are hurting and they will criticize or blame in order to avoid their own pain. So hurt people hurt other people. They judge, they blame, they criticize. Many times they are silent, they withhold. We're gonna talk about withholding information. Last week I told you, in most situations, unless it's legal or a policy or regulatory, human to human, connections, withholding information is as um, hurtful, painful, um, unhealthy as lying, and we'll talk about that. The sarcasm, right? A lot of times they want to tell you something that's hard, and, and they'll cover it up in humor and sarcasm. Because why? Then you can't say anything back. It was just a joke. Welcome all, welcome all. Um, and they're passive aggressive. Passive aggressive is a way of bullying because it's not authentic and it's not honest. And whether they're making you a rescuer or a victim, you have nowhere to go with the passive aggressive style. So again, to get out of the triangle, learn to say no, set your boundaries, listen to Sorry about that. Listen to self, feel the feelings, have no agenda, release your attachment to the outcome. Do something different, make I statements. This is really big, this was big for me. I never spoke in the first person. I always spoke in the, in the third person, you, or second person, whichever one that is. Um, be assertive. And by being assertive, find and speak your truth without judgment or blame. That was extremely hard for me. I was one of those withholders of information. Um, 
didn't didn't ever want to hurt anyone. Welcome, Barry. Didn't want to hurt anyone, so I withheld information. And if all of you can let me know if you can hear me okay, that would be great. I would appreciate that. Um, just hit the like or love button. So I would withhold information in order to not face you know, the truth or whatever. So withholding information is a big one. All right. Welcome all. Thank you. So let's talk, let's talk about withholding, right? And it happens in your love relationships. Withholding happens in your work relationships. And again, we're talking about human-to-human -human connections. Um, it's similar to lying. Now, if you can't for legal reasons, right, or regulatory reasons or policy reasons, you have to withhold information. I'm Another one, sorry about that. Um, understand that if you withhold information outside of these issues, right, there's an agenda or an attachment to the outcome. All right. So a perpetrator, right, the bully, withholds information with the intent right, to create an outcome of their choosing or um, to have an agenda. And both of those are, are closely related. So imagine that if a person had the information that you were withholding, they would choose differently. You have an attachment to the outcome. You absolutely do. You're not being authentic. If the other person needs that information in order to make a choice of their choosing, you withholding the information changes their game. Changes their game, and you do not have the right to do that. So with honest communication, bring everything you know to the table and allow the other person to make a choice, a choice that works for them. It's really hard. Sometimes people leave us. Sometimes we lose our job. Sometimes we don't get the position we wanted. But withholding the information is not healthy. It's not healthy for you, and it's not healthy for them. So rescuers withhold information as well. Rescuers withhold information in order, most of the time, right, their intent is to prevent somebody else's pain. But that's not healthy either. Because the other person, right, the other person may need whatever this information is for their own personal growth. Be it painful it is absolutely necessary for their growth. It can stall them coming into their own power. It can stall them from learning about themselves, right? Their own strength. We see this a lot with our children, right? We don't want them to go through anything sad. We don't want them to have pain. We don't want them to be, um, you know, ostracized, bullied, not not part of the group, and we, we rescue, we withhold them, withhold um, information that might make them feel bad. We're not really helping them. We're not rescuing them from themselves, right? We're rescuing them from their natural growth. And a victim, most of the time, will withhold information to avoid responsibility. Remember, the victim looks to others to meet their needs. And so, for instance, kids use this a lot because telling would get them in trouble. So they withhold information, right? They haven't lied yet. They're withholding information. When they do that, right, they're withholding information because they feel they will get in trouble. And they might. They might not, but they feel it. 
they are automatically making the other person a perpetrator. The other person doesn't even know yet that they are going to be a perpetrator. So many times they'll also do that because they don't feel they can do something. So they will withhold information and won't say anything. And the victim feels like they're powerless and they can't do it. And so they'll just not tell anyone. Almost always catches up, right? And then they deal with it then. But at the time, they're withholding information. So if any of you guys have any questions about this, please type it in. Um, hit the like and love. If you can see this in others or yourself, especially in a work relationship, right? How withholding information um, is not authentic communication. It's not good for you and it's not good for them. And again, this is human to human. All right, so let's talk about lying, right? It's a close cousin, thank you. It's a close cousin to withholding information. But I want you to know that although lying is not okay, I would ask you, instead of just blatantly calling it on its face and shutting yourself down, to explore the intent behind the lying. It's easy to see that with children, not so hard with other adults, or not so easy with other adults. So what is the intent behind the lying? It can open the door to communication. This would be one time when you would want the door open, right, to open communication to continue this healing between two people. I will tell you that a perpetrator generally has an intent in lying to hurt because hurt people hurt other people. That's usually the motive behind their lying. A rescuer is generally trying to spare the feelings of the other. They're trying to spare them from hurt from the hurt or the pain of the truth. And I want you to hear the difference between the intent to hurt and the intent that I'm sparing them this pain because as a rescuer, I see them as incapable, not strong enough, or broken and can't handle the truth. So I'd like to know if you guys hit like or love, if you see the difference. So hurt people hurt other people. They lie with the intent to hurt. The rescuer is trying to spare the other, but by doing so makes them a victim, just like the perpetrator. Thank you, thank you. Just like the perpetrator, because they don't see the person as strong enough to handle the truth or capable of handling the truth. We are still in the triangle. And the victim, right? We talked about getting in trouble, right? So they will tell a lie to get out of trouble or to stay out of trouble. But also, so many times, the victim, especially if they live in victimhood, right, where it's, it's a natural part of their day, they absolutely see the world as a victim. They're not just in the triangle playing all the roles, they mostly play that one. They may not be able to face the truth because they feel that they are too injured or broken. So a child many times will lie to get out of trouble, but an adult victim, right, many times lies because they can't face the truth. It's a form of denial. All right. So, I want to move into lying and expand it as part of, of you know, why we lie 
is shame, guilt, and denial. So the person lying is coming almost always from a place of shame, guilt, or denial with their agendas and their attachment to the outcome. So the perpetrator, when they feel shame or guilt, they blame someone else. They bully someone else. They lie with the intent to hurt another in order to avoid their own feelings, the shame or the guilt. A rescuer may lie for the same reason, shame or guilt. Now, generally, it comes from trying to save the other from the pain of the truth. And it may be the pain of their truth for which they can't at this moment face. And a victim, a victim many times wallows, right, in this despair of shame and guilt. And many times will lie, right, because the shame and guilt is too heavy. And again, they feel too broken to handle the truth. So in order to get out of the withholding and the lying, whether it's a work relationship or a love relationship or even your children, right, parents and children, you must first do something different. The triangle doesn't work. That's why it's a never-ending program or script. If you find yourself in a situation over and over and over again, and at some point you're surprised that you're in it again, right? We have the same fight over again, over again. We've, we've consistently been throughout our entire relationship had the same argument. Then you're in the triangle, right? It's, it's a non-ending loop. You will consistently play it until you do something different. So what can you do different? One is to set new boundaries. Or if you have boundaries, but you never, you, know, you never honor them, start to honor your boundaries. Pause. Pause before you get in the triangle in the same old script that you've always had. Let's say that you lie or you withhold information, no matter what part of the triangle you're in. Pause. Do you really want it to be different? And if you do, find another way. You can learn to say no, especially for rescuers. Learn to say no. Listen to self. What are your needs that are not being met? Is there a better way to meet these needs? And if you're in the triangle, I will tell you there's always a better way. Feel your feelings. This is really good for the bully because they almost always have deep hurt and they do not know how to feel the feelings. Have no agenda. So in your words and in your actions, let go of the agenda. Right, so many times, and I know I, I did this, so again, if you do this, know that I did it too. I would plan out the argument. So I'm going to say this, but if this person comes back with this, then what are my options? In order to get them to move where I wanted them to move. So for instance, in human resources, right, if we were dealing with some kind of a disciplinary action, my agenda was to get them to do it the way that their supervisor or me thought they should. So there was an agenda, absolutely an agenda. And the attachment to the outcome, it needed to look a certain way. Now, in some instances, that was absolutely legitimate. But let's say it's between a husband and wife. Hi, Todd. Welcome. Let's say it's between a husband and a wife. And we use lying, withholding information, um, all of the other traits, right, caught up in the triangle in order for the spouse to agree to X, Y, or Z. Let's say a new house, moving, a new job. And we do it without being open 
to what they authentically and sincerely want. We've withheld information so that they would make the decision we wanted them to. Or we purposely lie so that they will make the decision that we want them to. That's triangle. And it will always come back because at some point the truth will come out. Circumstances will change. So many times, right, then our relationships are built on a, on a foundation of cards, right? And any wind will blow them down. So again, when we look for our happiness, our satisfaction, our safety, our stability, our love outside of us, outside of us, we are building our house, our foundation on a house of cards. And any breeze will blow it down. So the truthful, authentic, sincere communication may not bring you the outcome you want, but you are resourceful and you are resilient and you will find a way. And if you are full of self-love, self-value, self-respect, self-appreciation, you can handle anything that comes your way, anything that comes your way. It does not have to come from a certain outcome in order to produce your peace and your joy. So I want you to hear that. It's not the outcome that will produce your inner peace, your inner joy, your inner love. But we are trained that way. And so doing this work, that's why the triangle changed my life, changed my life drastically. I followed it up with 10 weeks of intense personal growth at the Hypnotherapy Academy. <clears throat> so I want you to know that doing this work, this triangle work, will absolutely make a change in your life. I'm going to cough. Sorry about that, still fighting allergies. <laughs> <coughs> so, <coughs> before this coughing fit, so sorry. I believe in this stuff. <coughs> the, tri <coughs> the triangle saved my life, absolutely saved my life. Gave me the foundation for the work that I did at the Hypnotherapy Academy gave me the foundation for the work that I'm doing here. Absolutely, I would not be sitting in front of you telling you all about, you know, my triangle work if I did not have self-love and respect and value and appreciation, if I did not believe in myself like I'm hoping that you can believe in you. You can handle whatever comes your way. <laughs> without going into manipulation, right? Without going into lying or withholding information in order to get your way. You can meet your needs from your inner self and then that builds your resiliency and that gives you the resources you need to handle anything that comes your way, anything. And I want you to know that anything. If you have it here, you can take care of it there. All right, so before that horrible interruption. So I want to talk about um, complaining. <laughs> so we all do it. We all do it for different reasons. <clears throat> I want to talk about complaining just to. Right? It's not solution-based. You are not um, trying to better the situation because you're complaining to people who have no power to make a change. You're complaining just to, or um, 
It, it kind of complements gossiping. So absolutely triangle work, right? The perpetrator, when they complain, absolutely they're judging and blaming and criticizing. And it's done in order for them to feel better about themselves. So they may be lacking self-value or self-respect or self-appreciation, whatever that is that they're lacking. And complaining, making somebody else lower than, makes them feel better than. And it absolutely helps them to feel better about themselves, right? They're getting their needs met by judging, blaming, or criticizing someone else or how it's done. So you will often hear them say they're not doing it right. They are not doing it right. They don't know what they're doing, but whatever it is, they, they're not doing it right. The rescuer comes at complaining from that arrogance of all knowing, right? They know what's best for people. They know what's best for people. That's a, a trait of the rescuer. And the difference is between the rescuer and the perpetrator, instead of not doing it right, the rescuer still is judging, blaming, criticizing, but they're doing it with they could do it better, right? If only they would do this, it would be better because they have all knowing. And the victim complains from despair and from a position of there's no choices, right? I'm complaining because there's no choices. I'm complaining because the world is a horrible place and I'm in despair. So gossiping, very similar to complaining, is actually self-judgment. I told you that judgment, all judgment is self-judgment. So, so gossiping scars deeply. Complaining isn't a lot better, but gossiping is always um, manipulative and malicious. It just is. And it scars deeply because anything horrible you say from your mouth to another or listen with your ears goes in. It goes in and it affects you in here, your belief system. So let's say, right, that, and most gossiping, I would say, is from a perpetrator stance in the, in the triangle. If you are the speaker, you are the one that initiates the gossip, you absolutely are judging, blaming, or criticizing. We don't gossip good news. We always gossip bad. And how do we know that we're gossiping? Because we almost always say, don't tell anybody what I'm about to tell you. Right? That should be your first clue. If it was good news, you would sing it from the rooftops. It's almost always bad news. It's almost always judgment, blame, and criticism. We are absolutely bullying others to feel better about ourselves. We are spreading that information about others so that we look better, right? We're, we're seen in a better light. If we listen, we are in a passive, aggressive, bullying stance. We are still a perpetrator in the triangle. We listen passively, aggressively, in order to judge, blame, and criticize without instigating it, right? We don't want to be the scene as the one who starts gossip, but we sure do listen. And that's a passive aggressive stance. We are still active in it. We absolutely have the choice of not getting involved in gossip. Now, I'm telling you, it's a deep born want of most of us. There is something about gossip that is just intoxicating. It's up to us to break the addiction. 
Now, if we are the spreader, right? We didn't instigate it, but we heard it, and now we're going to spread it. We're both. We're the speaker and the listener. We almost always have an agenda to spread this gossip. We have an agenda. Know what yours is. Get out, right? What we are doing is we are seeing our own reflection in the mirror, but we're trying to deflect it onto someone else. We spread gossip because there is something deep within us that this is true about us as well. It may not look exactly the same, but there is some guilt or shame behind it. There is some guilt or shame behind it because we are drawn to it because there's something in us. Right? So I don't listen to gossip about you know football. I don't have any interest in it. But if it's somebody I know, I had an interest in it. If it was a situation similar to my own, I had an interest in it. If it was somebody else's kids, right, because I had kids. So if it was about their kids, I had an interest in it. So I want you to know it was difficult for me to look inside and to see that that could possibly be true about me. So when I heard, right, I was introduced to the fact that this was a mirror of me. That was a hard one. But if you'll allow it and you'll follow it, right? I told you, all of it, follow it in. Find out what your gunk is. Work on it. And the gossip won't be intoxicating. It won't have the same draw, right? The same hook. So for instance, with my children, again, I'm a rescuer, I'm a people pleaser, I'm a perfectionist. The gossip was my barometer of how good of a mom I was. Right? What a horrible barometer to know instead that I'm doing the best I can. Right? And I didn't know this information back then. Right? <laughs> I wish I did. If I could have known, based on my own abilities, my own love, my own security, that I was a good mom, the gossip about somebody else's child would not have had a hook. So whether it's for you in relationships, I can do a what if on work. Let's say that there is a position that you covet, you really would like it. And somebody comes to you and says, hey, do you know so-and-so, the head of that department? I heard they weren't doing so well, right? So it pique your interest because it's an opening for you. I want you to know that that scars you. Why? Because you may be in the same situation. It scars you. Could you really want the downfall of another in order to better yourself? That's how it scars you. Is it natural? Absolutely. Have we all done something similar? We have. But look at it. Look at it through the eyes of love and understanding. Get out of the triangle. Right? Release that agenda. Release that attachment to the outcome. Make I statements. Pause. Say no. Right? If somebody wants to come to you and say, Hey, do you know what I heard about so-and-so? Say, no, no thank you. No thank you. If there's something I need to know, I will go to that person. Right? Stops it right there. So pause, say no, do something different. And I will tell you with gossip and complaining, they're highly addictive. And it takes a lot of work. I haven't gotten there all the way yet, but I bet you I'm about 90% there, and it feels really good. It feels really good. All right, so hit the like and love button on that one. I would love to hear what you guys think 
about the information that we've covered so far. So if you can, leave me a message. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Great, great. Leave me some comments. I would love to hear more. All right, so those were the big ones. Withholding, lying, gossiping, um, complaining. But there's others, right? There's so many that we, that we do in the triangle. For instance, thank you. For instance, let's say that you're at work and somebody or you is consistently taking credit, right? So job well done, they take all the credit. That is absolutely triangle work. Absolutely triangle work. Because you are a victim of that, it has to be. Right, so we'll play around with where it really goes. Um, not definitely, not the rescuer. Right, they are not trying to fix you in order to avoid their own pain. Taking credit I say it would be in the bully or the perpetrator. Yes, so um, again, how do you get out? If you are the victim, you must find and speak your truth without judgment or blame. That would be the first one I would go to. So, either going to the person who took all the credit going to their supervisor who took all the credit, or wherever you have an audience, not complaining, this has to be solution-based. You must take it to someone who can take action. Find and speak your truth without judgment or blame of the other, right? Because otherwise you're just back in the triangle. So, uh, yes, this is true. And there were many people that were on this project that brought it to the successful conclusion. That would be finding and speaking your truth and not judgment or blame, right? Because judgment or blame would sound like, yeah, they always take all the credit and they forget about all of us. There's judgment and there's blame in there. There's a difference. Let's say, right, that um, someone who takes all the credit, where else could that be? You guys have any ideas, any uh, things that are happening with you now? So someone who takes all the credit, again, is making victims, right? Um, definitely making victims. They would be the perpetrator. They don't fit the rescuer mold. So observing this from an outsider position, an observer position, gives you a different set of eyes, right? a different understanding of what's going on. Now, if this person is someone that you want to work well with, you may be able to go with, to them, right, privately and say, you know, I want you to be a really good leader. I want you to be a good team leader. But when you take all the credit and you don't recognize your, your team who got you there, then they may withhold, right? They may not give you all that they have. So you can go ahead and be a leader from a position, right? Maybe it's your supervisor. If you can find and speak your truth without judgment or blame, you will leave the door open. If you come at it through judgment and blame, the door will close automatically because they will put up their wall of defense. All right, what about at work if you do someone else's work for them? You consistently are taking on a heavier load. Sometimes, and this was one of mine, it was just easier if I did it myself. So I'd love to hear, I'd <laughs> love to see the like button if you have ever said that. It's just easier if I do it myself. It takes too much time to train them. It takes too much time, right? It takes too much time to train them. It's just easier if I do it myself. It is their job, but I'm going to do it because it's just easier if I do it myself. That is a rescuer, and you are creating a victim, and you're doing this because you do not think they are capable of doing it themselves. You haven't helped them. You haven't helped you. 
they need to be able to do this work. If it is in their job description, let's say it's a job you're passing down, or passing along, you continuing to do it doesn't help them, and it doesn't help you. What if you continue to do someone else's job or carry a heavier load, right, an unfair load, because you don't want them to get into trouble? So hit the like or love button if you recognize yourself. If you don't want them to get in trouble, but are you really helping them? Just like our children and never wanting them to feel pain or hardship, we stunt their growth. We stall it. We absolutely do. So we're somewhat playing with Mother Nature, right? <laughs> because they need the lesson. They need to know how. We give them a greater gift. This is for your rescuers out there. We give them a greater gift when we help them stand on their own, when we help them come into their own power. All right, so we talked about lying, withholding. I wanna talk about retaliation and especially in personal relationships. That would be a this for that, right? If you do that, I'm gonna do this, right? And it is absolutely a perpetrator victim issue. Very rarely does a rescuer do, do that because they're almost always trying to rescue somebody from themselves. It's the retaliation would fall into the perpetrator role. We are absolutely using manipulation in order to drive an outcome of our choosing. And I want you to hear, although that is so hard, we do want things to work out the way we want them to work out. We're not allowing them to be natural and organic based on the sovereignty of the other party. And let's say it is a love relationship and we deeply love this person. They should have the sovereign right to make their own decisions. And if we are coming from our personal power, from our self-love, respect, value, and appreciation, if we are coming from that place, we can give them the space in order to make their own decisions. From doing that, we can then negotiate. We can negotiate honestly and authentically. But any time that we withhold or we retaliate or we do anything with an agenda and an attachment to the outcome, we are not being authentic. And it is usually driven by fear, right? We have a fear that we have to control it in order for it to work out the way we want it to. Instead of, if it works out, that's wonderful. If it comes close, that's wonderful. If they absolutely don't want to do it that way, then what are we going to do? We still have a choice, right? We can renegotiate or we can move on. There's all kinds of choices. But we have, we have a responsibility to that other person, especially in a love relationship, to be authentic and to negotiate from an authentic position. Retaliation is absolutely bullying, it's perpetrating. We are controlling the situation and not allowing the other person their full sovereignty, making them a victim in order to get the outcome we want. So hit the like or love if you're following along. And placing blame, absolutely a perpetrator role, right? They blame, judge, and criticize in order to get their needs met. Any situation has two sides. It always does. And truth is fluid. Truth is fluid. We talked about that in, I don't know, week two or three. It's not concrete. 
you and I can see the same thing and come away with two different versions. Truth is always filtered by our deep sense of self, who we are, how we see the world. And so is theirs. So they can say something and it be true for them and absolutely look false to you. Absolutely. So truth is fluid. So placing blame as a perpetrator role. We're not allowing that other person, their sovereign right, to be equal and to finally speak their truth as we finally speak ours. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about truth. Again, truth is fluid. It's not concrete. When we become concrete in our beliefs, we absolutely cannot see another's truth. So we're going to really dig into communication next week. And so much of this will, will be really clear in that to, when to leave a door open and when to, when to close a door. So again, if you walk in and they're gossiping, that would be a time to close your door. If you want to have authentic communication, you want the door open. You want their door open and you want your door open. And so understanding how they come to their truth will help you keep the doors of communication open. Absolutely, the first responsibility is knowing where you come from. Do you have trust issues? Right? Do you have um, victim issues, guilt issues? Right? What is it that you're coming with? What weakness? As I've told most of you, I had one of not being wanted, not being worthy, not being lovable, being a mistake, right? So those are my woundings that I come to. I come to the table with those. The old me didn't know. So anybody that I was working with, they weren't really astute in this, right? Could trigger those in me just by their words and their actions. So if I wasn't included on a committee, for instance, that would go deep into my wounding of not being wanted not belonging. Even though it may have been legitimate, I couldn't have seen it that way because I was seeing it through my wounded eyes, my not wanted eyes. And that colored my truth. Right? So when I would tell a story about not being included, it would include these threads of truth that I would weave together into a story that would support my position. And guess what? The other person in communication does as well. The other person in the relationship is doing the same. They are weaving together the threads that fit their story. Getting out of the triangle will allow you to see that work in progress. It gives you different tools. It gives you a different vantage point in order to understand you and the other person. All right, let's see what else I had written down. I'd be happy if only. So this is in relationships. Well, actually in work too. I'd be happy if only I could get a raise. I'd be happy if only this person would you know, quit traveling so much for their job and, you know, quit and stay home. I'd be happy if only they made more money. So we've talked about happiness comes from within, comes from inside you. You generate happiness and you take it with you everywhere you go. No outside circumstance, event, people, thing can make you happy. Just can't. Happiness comes from within. And then you take happiness to every event, person, place, thing, and you shower it with your happiness and you become more happy with it or with them. It's the way it works. And if you can really start to work with that, you can create your own happiness. 
Whenever you look outside of yourself for anything, whether it's love, validation, happiness, um, you will always be disappointed. It has to be. It has to come from within. It has to be self-generated. All right. And then I had pretending. And pretending is very similar to withholding and lying. In that we just are not looking at what it is. We are looking at it through wounded eyes and what we want it to be. And it really clouds our judgment, clouds our relationships. And it happens to many of us. It's really a very subtle one to catch because all reality, right, is based on our perception of it. And so we can sometimes pretend as if it were true and never cut, catch the subtle um, facts, right, or f the red flags or the little clues that we're, we're living in a, in a fantasy world. And so pretending is also part of the triangle. It comes from a victim standpoint. So it is the victim who will do the pretending because they don't want to take responsibility for their own feelings and their own results, and so they pretend. All right, well, that's all I had. Unless you guys have any questions, please type them in. Um, we have a few minutes, and if you'd like, I can take you into a guided relaxation. It'll be a very short one. So if you're ready, go ahead and find a safe position, a comfortable position, and settle in. Thank you. Settle in and close your eyes and begin by taking a deep breath in. As you breathe in deeply, exhale fully, and let your thoughts clear. Just clear your mind. So inhale fully, take a deep breath, exhale, and let your thoughts clear. And again, deep breath in. Exhale fully and let your thoughts clear. Now imagine that you're at the top of the staircase with 10 steps leading down. With every number I count, you take a step down and you repeat the number quietly in your own mind. Stepping down 10, going deeper and deeper within. Nine, every step down takes you deeper. Eight, relaxing more now than ever before. Seven, stepping down, feeling lighter and lighter. Six, every step down, you feel more relaxed, lighter and lighter. Five, almost there, just a few more steps as you step down. Four. One more step, three, stepping down, going deeper within, relaxed more now than ever before. Two, doubling your relaxation as you step down, one, and one more step. And imagine yourself out in nature on a well-worn path. This path is familiar. The walking is easy. You look down at your feet, and you notice whether you have shoes or you're barefoot. You're just walking, feeling it. The sun is warm on your skin. There's a breeze that brushes by. You hear the sounds of nature, the birds, the sound of a babbling brook nearby. And you see the colors, the vibrant colors of nature all around you. And you're walking. And you're absolutely in peace and joy, complete comfort. You're just enjoying this experience. This is the truest essence of who you are. Peace and joy, love, understanding. It's the purest essence of who you are. It matters not what's occurring all around you. It matters. 
that's occurring within. You are connecting to the very best of you. Your soul, your spirit, your Holy Spirit, whatever, whatever speaks to you, whatever calls to you, this is who you are connected to now. The very best, the very essence of who you are. And it matters not what's occurring outside of you. It matters what's occurring within you. This is the very best of who you are, the very essence of who you are, the light and love that you were sent to earth to be. And you connect, you connect deeply to this place surrounded by nature. You are on the right path, your path. And it was said once that you can't do it wrong and you never get it done. You just continue on the journey. It's not the destination. It is the journey and you are on the right path. And it was said once that you can never get it wrong and you can never get it all done. You continue on your path in life the very best of who you are. And you bring the very best of who you are to everyone you meet and to every situation, every event, every place, every day. And you just allow yourself this knowing you are the very best, the very best version of you And we always aspire to be better, to be kinder, to be gentler. But today, today you are the very best version of you. You are loving and kind, gentle and compassionate. You are full of peace and joy. And here, in this place, you're in pure comfort, pure safety and security. And this place is always within you, always within reach. You can come back here anytime that you want to. And go ahead and make your way back. Take your time. Make your way back to the staircase, bringing with you the very best of you, the very deepest essence of who you are, the purest essence of who you are. And you bring this back with you as you make your way to the staircase. The staircase with 10 steps leading up. Stepping up, one, slowly, calmly, easily, and gently, returning to your full awareness once again. Two, every muscle, nerve, and fiber in your body feels good. Three, stepping up, coming back to the sound of my voice. Four, feeling wonderful, centered and grounded. Five, bringing back with you the very best of who you are, the purest essence of who you are. Six, stepping up. Take a deep breath in. You can wiggle your fingers and toes and move your head from side to side. Seven, almost there. Eight, another deep breath in. Again, wiggling your fingers and toes, feeling centered in your body. Nine, ready to open your eyes on the next number I count. And ten, eyes open. I hope you enjoyed that. And thank you so much for your patience for my um, rambling. <laughs> and not, and uh, kind of winging this and going from my gut. So I want you to know that I live this and I'll share it with you at any time. And I hope that you found this useful and purposeful and something that beneficial for your own life. And again, next week, we will be doing communication because again, communication is key to all relationships. So thank you so much. I thank each and every one of you I wish you love, light, and wonder on your journey in life, and I hope that our paths cross someday. Thank you.